Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this On Aging Conversation. I'm Barbara McMillan, Provincial Community Engagement Coordinator for United Way British Columbia's Healthy Aging Team. And I'd like to start by acknowledging and expressing appreciation for the opportunity to live, work, and gather on the traditional ancestral territories of all First Nations in this land we now call Canada. On Aging Conversations is a collaboration between Healthy Aging Corps and Help Age Canada. If you missed earlier episodes, you can find them on Apple or Anchor Podcasts on YouTube and on Healthy Aging Corps Canada, the national knowledge hub connecting agencies that support and advance independent living for older Canadians. And the lineup of on aging speakers on core and links to the recordings, along with a lot of other interesting and useful information can be delivered to your inbox if you're signed up for the twice monthly core e-news, which you can do at www.healthagingcore.ca. In our work with CORE, HelpAge, and the extraordinary network of community-based senior serving agencies, volunteers, and professionals across Canada, we are privileged to encounter many thought leaders and innovators in the field of healthy aging. And so On Aging Conversations was launched to help bring some of these ideas, innovations, and perspectives to a wider audience. And that's it, a 30-minute conversation with a featured guest providing healthy aging information, ideas, and inspiration every two weeks. And I'll now turn it over to Gregor Snedden, CEO of HelpAge Canada, your host for On Aging. Thanks, Barb, and welcome everyone. HelpAge Canada supports community-based initiatives through its partnerships across Canada and all over the world to improve the lives of older persons and their communities. And it's a real privilege and joy today to be joined by Helen McDonnell. And we were just pondering, this may be our first podcast with an East Coaster. And so just thrilled to get to have a chat with Helen, who we have the privilege and a lot of fun working with on a number of different things. Now, Helen is Executive Director of Community Links, a community-based organization that for over 30 years has been connecting individuals and seniors senior living organizations, sharing information and resources so older adults can remain active, engaged, and valued in their communities. And Helen sits on the Seniors Advisory Council to the Government of Nova Scotia and the Nova Scotia Center on Aging Advisory Board. She is a fellow of NSGov Lab, an initiative of the Nova Scotia Department of Seniors using social innovation to find new ways to support older adults. She's an award-winning mental health advocate and founder of Women and Wellness, an awareness and fundraiser which has raised over one and a half million dollars for the Canadian Mental Health Association. It's a real joy to have you with us today, Helen. Welcome. Thank you ever so much. It's uh, lovely to be here. So Helen, you've got such an interesting background and you're so invested in mm -hmm. the issues facing older people and your work at Community Links as executive director. Tell us a little bit about how you arrived into this space. Where, where are you from? How did you end up with such a passion for older people? I am Nova Scotian, born and bred, and grew up in a small town about 100 miles from Halifax in Glasgow, and did all the things you do growing up and, and going to work, going to school, became a journalist and then a lawyer, but partway along the way, when my husband had an opportunity to move to New Brunswick with the law firm he was working with, I chose to stay home with our kids. Did a lot of volunteer work as a mom and, you know, doing the things you do, but in 2000 and three lost a brother to suicide. When that happened, we didn't have an awareness of what my brother was living with, which was bipolar disorder. And after he died, he was 47. I read all his journals and I said, what the heck is this? What's this bipolar disorder? What was happening? They understood from what he written that he worked really, really hard to help himself and save himself, but yet didn't share that battle and journey with us. So I started to talk to people about mental illness and did a lot of research and trying to understand what had happened to him. But through that and my conversations with people began to understand how every family was impacted and everyone had someone and often themselves who were living with depression or just bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, whatever, anxiety, whatever it was. And long story short, spent about a dozen years really engaging as a volunteer and work with Mental Health Association and raising funds and awareness across the country. Then in 2014, my kids were grown and gone and I told the story so many times on stages across the country 
country and had the privilege of people sharing their personal stories with me. But it was like pulling the scar open every time and revisiting our personal pain as well as taking on others' pain. And I had kind of felt I'd done all that I could as a volunteer in that space and handed it off back to the CMHA and said, here's this event that's been held in a number of provinces and I've done what I can, but this is yours. I need to move forward and move back to Nova Scotia after almost 20 years in New Brunswick. I wanted to lean into healthy aging. Who was looking into that? Who was looking after that for Nova Scotians? And oh, by the way, I've done a whole lot of work as a volunteer, but I'd really like to get paid now. <laughs> Because 21 years between paychecks, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to be a bit more independent that way. And long story short, the opportunity with Community Links came up and they trusted me, despite 21 years out of the paid for world of work, that I could lead this organization. So I've had the honor and privilege for the last four and a half years to do that. And three of, years, three of those years have been with COVID. So it's been a, wow. quite a journey. <laughs> I bet that is quite a journey. Tell us a little bit about Community Links, Nova Scotia. What do you guys do? So Community Links is an organization that's focused on supporting healthy aging across the province. It's all about connecting community organizations and the folks that do work at the community level. It's been around for over 30 years. It started out with the recognition that in the very rural community, things happening being done for and by older adults, but people weren't sharing those across the regions or across the province. And so there was this project that then became Community Links that was all about bringing those groups and organizations together regionally and then cross province, sharing those stories, sharing resources, and also doing like education about how can you be advocates? How can you attract more volunteers? What do you need to uh, run a board? Those kind of things. Community Links was created to enable connections between and among community members and organizations based on the recognition that there was all kinds of neat things happening in various rural and remote parts of the province, but people weren't in other locations weren't aware of that and they were doing things that should be shared and promoted and celebrated, but also there was a need for advocacy training. And then as with many nonprofits, the need arose to focus a little bit, follow money and uh, so it became about fall prevention and, and all the different elements of that. And in 2012 or so, broadened back out to age-friendly communities and all the uh, pillars of what creates an age-friendly community. So it's like everyone and everything evolved over the years, but more than three decades of working focused on healthy aging, celebrating the work of older adults and connecting community organizations to make us all stronger. Oh, that's fantastic. I want to actually hear a little bit about how is it that, you know, you've just been through Hurricane Fiona and Help Age was able to offer you a little bit of support in your response. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? How did it affect older people? What was your response? And are we out of the woods? <laughs> and there's still lots of woods down. And certainly Fiona, when it hit on the weekend of September 24th, really struck Nova Scotia and particularly northern Nova Scotia and Cape Breton Island with a vengeance. Many people lost power and some lost power for more than a week, some for more than a couple of weeks and really flattened trees and damaged many, many homes and businesses. So it had a real impact. The response was instant. And it, it's one of those places when you know you're in a smaller community where the power of community bubbles up and is so important because people reached out and, you know, wanted just to help their neighbors as much as possible. And then Help Age helped externally reached out to us to offer assistance. Community Links, our role was to uh, connect with senior serving community organizations who could see on the ground where the need was for their populations of older adults and what the needs were. And we created a micro grant and sent $106,000, spread that around across the province, but predominantly those hardest hit areas. And almost 50% of those grants were used to support food programs, whether it was food pantries to bring hot meals, to create opportunities, food baskets, those kind of things. There was things like providing fuel for chainsaws because literally people, there were so many trees down and volunteer firefighters and different groups were uh, really having to clear paths to get to people's doors and get trees off sheds and roofs. Um, mm -hmm. So things like, you know, just helping people pay for broken chainsaws was a bit of, you know, where the money went. So it was across the spectrum. Very, very much appreciate it. Super appreciate it. 
Are we out of the woods yet? I think there are places where there are still people who have had, are still need, in need of repairs to homes. We're just in the news last week, they're talking about folks in Cape Breton whose roofs were kind of patched together, but because of a housing challenge that we have, they weren't able to move out of their homes so that repairs are taking much longer because they're having to work around people still trying to live in their homes and things. So, wow. yeah. And, you know, the money that came if you're fortunate enough to be insured, you're probably okay. But for folks who were relying on the assistance that the government provided, it was $250 to help remove trees and $100 for every household that lost power for at least 48 hours to cover the cost of spoiled food. And, you know, so always helpful, but never enough. What a challenging situation for a community. And I know Nova Scotians and East Coasters are known for their really tight community. But as you noted to me about the real influx of older people to Nova Scotia during COVID. And so there's a lot of, you know, potentially older people that, that haven't really had an, a lot of time to really find their place in community and they're kind of on their own. That must have some impact too. I guess that's a whole other can of worm is how do you guys work with newcomers to Nova Scotia? It's really interesting because Nova Scotia during COVID and well, over the last eight years, for decades, Nova Scotia, we saw out migration. People did not move here. They moved away from here. Young people moved to Alberta, moved to Ontario, moved to different places. And our population was declining and our median age was growing older. And I think at one point we were the oldest population in the country or for a number of years. But that turned around in 2015. It began to turn around and, and um, certainly over COVID accelerated. So we went from a population of about 935,000 in 2015 to 1,037,000 this past January. Wow. So we added 100,000 people and a lot of those folks came during COVID and, and many of them were younger folks either coming here for the first time or coming back home. But we also attracted a lot of older adults who may have come because their kids came or may have had moved away for work to Alberta or you know wherever wherever it was, but then um, decided to come home. Or uh, upper Canadians, Ontarians, who loved the visits they had, and or maybe had a summer place, and in the height of COVID, decided they were getting the heck out of Dodge and, and getting down here where life was good. <laughs> and it is, it's very good, but it's also a complicated place if you're not from here, because we are friendly, but not always welcoming, and we'll be smile and greet you, but we might not invite you for dinner. So that's an issue we need to deal with we're cautious about quote unquote come from a ways. But at the same time, uh, folks that move here bring skills, ability, energy, uh -huh. uh, resources that can enhance our communities and enable us to learn new things and uh, grow in different ways. It's a challenge from both directions because if, like I said, I came back from New Brunswick and even though I'm from here, it was a whole new endeavor to find my path. And if you don't have roots here, it's probably even harder. So but the thing I learned out of my own struggles was how important it is to really figure out what it is that's important to you and then find out who's doing it and put your hand up and see how you can get engaged. And it doesn't have to be a paid job like I pursued, but you know, mm -hmm. Is there a choir? Is there a volunteer group mm. that's rebuilding those homes? Is there a community group that's having community suppers or theater or whatever it is, whatever brings you joy? Men's sheds would be a great example of somewhere mm. that would make it be a difference maker in small communities. So it is about not expecting people to welcome you with open arms, but be open to trying new things, investigating what might be possible, see where the like-minded folks are and reaching out person by person because this, this is a great place to be and to grow older in and we really want to encourage those folks who came here to stay there but to really share their skills and energy with the communities that they move to because more than half our population live in small rural communities. Well, on that note, I know you working hard as you guys look to continue the work that you outlined earlier with community-based seniors serving organizations in your province. And you're wrapping up a set of provincial consultations in community through that network of CBSS organizations. What are you hearing? And where's the province of Nova Scotia going in terms of serving senior serving organizations. 
Community Links received some grant funding to take a look at the current state of community clubs, groups, and organizations, senior serving organizations across the province and do a deep dive into what's happening, how they've come through COVID, um, what the needs are, but also the opportunities. At the same time, I got engaged with the national work that's being done to create a community-based senior serving summit, which is really lovely timing because they feed into one another. I don't think in Nova Scotia, senior serving organizations call themselves members of a sector yet. So part of our work is to understand the lay of the land and then begin to have conversations to see how we can work together more collaboratively and what the appetite for that was. And through those eight community conversations we held from one end of the province to the other in the last uh, several weeks, we really heard an appetite among organizations to shake off the COVID kind of dread that's kept people at home, kept people people from working together in, you know, in, in person because certainly we saw a great deal of collaboration during COVID across the video screens, but we heard very much a willingness to connect and collaborate and not to try and compete with one another, recognizing that lots of things are happening in lots of communities, but they might be happening five kilometers from one another in two small halls, and might we be able to kind of work together so we can support each other's events rather than schedule them both on the same night and then split the audience that we're trying to attract, that kind of thing. We had great turnouts. There was a great deal of energy among the folks that came and they came from volunteer organizations. They came from senior safety coordinators. They came from VON and, and different groups and agencies. All were anxious to have a curated and trusted space for updating and updated information about funding, community events, training, learning, networking opportunities. I think the volunteers were very positive and excited. And I, we found that the service providers, the paid service providers are more frustrated and feeling overwhelmed because of the uh, mm -hmm. lack of resourcing. So it was interesting when, you know, the, to compare and contrast those type of things really just become so evident that right across the country, we're all in need to be working together, you know, as we serve community-based organizations. The time is right, so to speak. And I think uh, Nova Scotia, you know, particularly under your leadership, is really moving in a fantastic direction and being able to provide those community consultations to hear that voice and how can we work together as a country on many of these same issues that we're all facing and trying to work on together. We partnered with the Impact Organizations of Nova Scotia to do the work we're doing because they're very excited about the potential of pulling out the senior serving sector as a subsector and really understanding what that means and what the unique needs and opportunities are in this space and how where an organization could be focused or where could partner with others that are already doing some of that work. So again, not to repeat or to compare compete, but how to complement one another and collaborate so we can be more effective, impact more people, reach more folks with training, with resources, and at the end of the day, build a better province for all of us to get older in. Oh, that was so beautifully put. We should write that. And thank you. I love the articulation of stating what we are, not what we're not. Well, Helen, you know, we've run out of time, but it's just been fantastic to hear from you and to learn more about Community Links Nova Scotia and the great work that you're doing there. We really look forward to our continued working with you and look forward to seeing what's on the horizon in Nova Scotia for older people. Thanks so much, Gregor. We have big, big dreams. We always aspire for higher than we can reach, but uh, we aspire high. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today for our On Aging podcast. We look forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks.